Good morning. My name is Michael Amberg. I'm one of the spiritual counselors with Home Health United Hospice. Good morning. I'm Lori. I'm a hospice nurse with Home Health United. And today we would like to speak to you guys about pain and pain control. Lori, I'll let you begin. Okay. Our caregivers who decide to care for their loved ones who are dying are under emotional stress. They not only have the emotional stress of a loved one dying, but they have this responsibility of being responsible for caring for them. Many of these caregivers have no formal training, so they experience anxiety, they get exhausted, and they feel burdened. So part of my talk today is going to be on how to get your caregivers comfortable and educated enough to feel like they're having a positive impact on their loved one. Correct. And another thing, too, they're so overwhelmed because not only are they looking at losing their loved one, but as Lori has stated, am I capable of helping my loved one? <clears throat> am I the one who's causing them the pain, the anxiety, and the grief? Right. Research indicates that pain is one of the most challenging symptoms to manage. Caregivers have the responsibility of assessing for pain, and even the word assessment to many of them is foreign. They don't know what that means. So part of our challenge is to speak in a language that they can understand. So maybe instead of using the word assessing, maybe use the words, um, are they in pain? Um, a lot of caregivers, especially our elderly, have a lot of anxiety about using a controlled substance. They also don't know how to assess for breakthrough pain or a PRN schedule medication. They don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. um, research indicates that we spend about 38% of our time focusing on pain, but we typically don't talk about the experiences of the caregivers and the responsibility that they have. So part of our job is to ascertain from our caregivers what their fears are and how we can help address those fears. Correct, correct. And a lot of that too is, as you're going to be describing, is the medication aspect of this. Right. Uh, the over-medication, the under-medication, right. all of a sudden, and, and I'm going to word it this way, oh my goodness, I just killed my loved one. Right. A lot of the anxiety with our caregivers comes from understanding the indications of the pain medication, the side effects, and the dosing. One of the things I always try to do is I will write the medication out with one or two words yes. explaining what it's for, and then I have a dose. A lot of caregivers aren't comfortable with just using um, up to the max dose. So some caregivers, you're going to want to have a specific schedule of the medication and the dose just because they're not comfortable with assessing, should I give more or should I give less? Give less. Um, and you also recommend them to write down yes. <clears throat> when yes. they get the medications yes. and how much, correct? Absolutely. And the outcome. Of that medication right and I do that and I always explain to my families that we don't critique it we don't criticize it it's just for your record so you don't have to concentrate on remembering okay when did I give my loved one such and such Correct. Um, one of the things I always stress with my families is families tend to under medicate so I tell my families if you stay within the max parameters of all their medications you're not going to hurt them mm -hmm. with all the families that I've helped care for their loved one. I've never had a family that I thought, oh, this family is going to give too much medicine. So I articulate that to my families, that please, families tend to under-medicate. So if your loved one needs medicine, please mm -hmm. give it to them because you're not going to hurt them. You're only going to help them. Isn't one of the fears, though, that if I give this medication, that patient is not going to be able to talk to me? Yes. Um, so part of the managing the, the pain and the medication for the caregivers is you need to explain to the caregivers what the side effects are. One of the side effects of many of the medications we use is going to be they're going to sleep. You also need to explain to the families, however, that even the, the disease progression is going to make the patient very sleepy and probably not that responsive. So by, by discussing this with your families and preparing them for the side effects, they have a much better handle on that. Correct. And isn't it also after they've had the medication for a couple of days, their body will adjust a little bit to that? Yes. And maybe another thing that we need to realize too, if they're awake, how much pain are they in? Are they comfortable? And right. is that what we really want for our loved one? 
is to be pain-free and comfortable, or do we want them to be painful to the point where we can't talk to them anyhow at that time? Right. Um, it's also important to talk to your families about how do you assess for pain. They don't know the nonverbal cues, so it's important that you talk to your families about what those nonverbal cues are. And also, what I give my families is I use an assessment scale. So I use the pain ND or AD scale, which is the pain assessment in advanced dementia. And it's a concrete tool they can use to better determine if their loved one is in pain. Um, it's a zero to 10 point scale, and it goes over the breathing, if they have negative, negative vocalization, their facial expressions, their body language, and then are they, are they comfortable? Do they appear that they're comfortable? And it's a zero to 10, just like our pain scale. So they can have a concrete tool to use to help guide them in if their loved one's in pain or not. What would be body language that they could witness? Um, if they're restless, if they're, they have facial grimacing, if um, they have contractures, if they seem all stressed or tense, okay. that's an indication that they're likely in pain. Okay, thank you for that. With that being said, too, there's also another part of this, which is called terminal restlessness. Yes. Could you explain from a nursing aspect what terminal restlessness is, please? Sure. Terminal restlessness is when the patient is, they're agitated or they're, they're moving around in bed. They just can't seem to get comfortable. They may verbally express that they need to get up. And it can be a sign where they're just simply restless or it can also be an indication that they're in pain. And one of the medications we can give for that is lorazepam. Restlessness is easier for the families to understand and to assess for but it's still, it's very important that gets addressed. Right. And would you say that the terminal restlessness is harder on the caregiver than the patient? Terminal restlessness is much harder on the caregivers. So that's why it's important to explain to your caregivers what it is, what mm -hmm. it means, and how to treat it. Right. And that kind of comes into the spiritual side of it. Everybody, I really believe, has their own spiritual walk. I did not use the word religion or faith because I believe it's a spiritual walk. And sometimes helping the family to understand that walk to help that patient through that. And that's what my role in this is also. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there again, we've had, I've had people where all of a sudden my loved one is really struggling. What can I do? And they've had the nurse in there. And the nurse said, you know, the patient is comfortable as far as by the medications, and this is that spiritual distress or terminal restlessness. There's been a few incidences where I've been able to go in, talk with the family, and maybe it was a family member that needed to tell their loved one that they would be okay with them or what the outcome is when they pass. By giving them that permission, that person was able to relax and then continue on their journey. Other things that can help restlessness are some external interventions, maybe have some soft lighting, you can play some soft music, make sure that voices are kept quite low, um, but we always encourage our caregivers to, to touch them and to love them, to hold their hand. Mm -hmm. They don't always have to say anything, but just to be there is the, reassurance enough sometimes. Yes, that presence is, is very much appreciated. Another thing too, if, if family members are looking at something to do, I just can't sit there. I recommend them grabbing the photo album sure. and just to sit there and describe these pictures to their loved one, you know. Thank you, Grandpa, for this this time when we went fishing, or thank you, Grandma, for teaching me how to sew. And, you know, I'm looking at this picture and, oh, I think that was Aunt So and so in this picture. With you as the caregiver talking to them about this. That person can he still hear you. The mm -hmm. listening is the one of the last things that leaves the body. So include them in that conversation because they still are here. Absolutely. Other issues you will have to deal with as end of life approaches is dyspnea. Shortness of breath is a physiological function oh, yes. of the body and it's very important that your caregivers are expecting the breathing pattern changes. Each patient is a little different as far as how their respirations will change, so I don't go into specifics. I basically leave the family with expect breathing pattern changes. It could be where they hyperventilate, 
where they breathe in and out deeply or where there's long periods of when the patient will take a breath. Again, you always mm -hmm. want to prepare the family for what may happen, so they, they expect it. Right. Prepare for the worst, and we're going to hope for the best, correct? Right. Yes. Um, one of the things I always talk about with shortness of breath and with my caregivers is oxygen mm -hmm. at end of life. I've looked at research because I think that sometimes if you apply oxygen as somebody's actively dying, Sometimes I think it extends that dying process. Re some research indicates that it does. Other research indicates that no, it is just a comfort. Mm -hmm. So I, I leave that with my families. I say it may or may not extend the dying process. If you're waiting for somebody to come, you may want to leave the oxygen on if the patient tolerates it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the patient may not want it at all. Some people may not find oxygen blowing in their nose a comfort. So you just have to leave it based on what the caregivers and the family Correct. wants, but just Correct. give them the option that they don't have to have the oxygen on if they don't mm -hmm. want it. Right. <clears throat> Another part of this, too, a little bit, it doesn't have to deal with the pain, but how about the eating patterns and the drinking patterns Absolutely. of our loved ones? That's a great point to bring up. You almost always get asked about food and nourishment. Um, and at end of life, nourishment is not needed. It takes a lot of energy for the body to break down food. It's, it's the chewing, it's the digesting, and your body is a machine and it will let the patient know what it needs and what it doesn't need. Most often, patients don't want to eat. So some caregivers have a very hard time with this concept because mm -hmm. our culture associates food Correct. with nutrition and happiness and health. And comfort. And comfort. And at end of life, that just isn't the case. So you want to explain that to the caregivers. Right. Additionally, at end of life, patients often are unable to suck from a straw. They just, it's the confusion, and again, it takes a lot of energy to do that. So I always leave a three or five cc syringe with directions for the caregivers to draw up fluid, whether they want beer, juice, water, whatever the patient would want, and draw up the, the liquid and then give it to the patient um, so they don't have to suck. Um, make sure that the patient's heads are elevated and that mm -hmm. the patient can swallow safely. Sometimes it, it, you want to give a little bit of fluid and tell the patient to swallow. You can also rub on their neck, uh, but it's important that they swallow. So you want to give those directions to your caregivers as well. Right. How about their lips? Say, I've seen patients where their lips and their mouths get so dry. Yes. Is there, what can we do to help family members with this? We have the, the den sticks that we use that you can dip in some water to keep the oral membranes nice and moist. You can put Vaseline or chapstick on the lips to keep them nice and moist. There's also some over-the-counter gels the families can purchase. Oral care is also very important, so I always yes. encourage my families to take one of the den sticks and dip that in Scope or Listerine and do some oral care to keep mm. their mouths nice and fresh. One of the things, too, I would like to ask you is sometimes we want to have our loved ones with their teeth in because they have dentures. At the end of life, is this a, an issue for the patient or is it an issue for the caregiver? usually an issue for the caregivers. Um, usually at end of life, patients have lost a lot of weight, so the dentures don't fit like they, like they did. Mm -hmm. can also be a choking hazard. So try to discourage the use of dentures at end of life. There's just, there's no, there's no purpose in okay. them at end of life. I've also witnessed, um, they come in every two hours, or they tell me as the caregiver, I need to turn my loved one every two hours. And every time I do, they grimace. Mm -hmm. What's going on? At end of life, repositioning the patient every two hours typically is not necessary. Um, leading up to when the patient actively dies, it's always a great idea to have your families reposition the patient if it's tolerable. And repositioning means it has to be a 30-degree angle. So, okay. And there's really three sides to reposition. There's left side, their back, and then their right side. But at end of life, when somebody's actively dying, repositioning really isn't necessary. If the caregivers insist on repositioning, certainly pre-medicate the patient with some pain medicine before they do that. Bringing us back to the medications, I've been told I need to give my my loved one here medications every hour. How am I going to sleep through the night if I have to get up every hour? Right. I 
I try not to encourage medication administration every hour unless that's absolutely necessary because your caregivers have to rest as well. If the patient needs something longer acting, maybe we want to put them on a fentanyl patch or something that doesn't have to be administered every hour. Unless there's several caregivers involved that can take mm. shifts, that's just that's not practical for the for the caregivers. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We were talking again about the caregivers. How about the caregivers? Do they ever need to take breaks? Absolutely. We need to assess the caregivers as much as we assess the patients because we can have the best plan of care for the patient, but if the caregivers aren't enforcing that mm -hmm. or utilizing the tools that we have that we have decided to use for the patient, it's no use. So the, the function of the caregivers is very much important in order to determine how that patient is going to be managed at home. So we need to take care of our caregivers also then? Absolutely. Right. And we encourage our caregivers every once in a while to take a two-hour break at a time because when you sit down and you figure, okay, I'm going to go to town and get groceries. Well, if you give yourself a one-hour window of time, you cannot get there and think about what you're doing before you have to rush back home. Right. A lot of caregivers have this fear that as soon as I leave, the patient may pass. And I always explain to families, and I know spiritual counselors are very good at this too, there are no accidents at end of life. Right. So the patient is going to pass away on their terms. And we may not like it, we may not understand it, mm -hmm. but if, if a loved one chooses to leave and the patient passes during that time, then they were waiting for that caregiver to give them time alone. So try to explain that to your caregivers that... The patient mm -hmm. will pass when they're ready to pass. So there's a lot to being a caregiver, not yes. only the patient, but also the caregiver. Yes. They say that dying is the hardest thing your loved one is going to do. But I also think being a caregiver is the hardest thing that you will ever have to do also. What's your feeling on that? I agree. And I think as nurses, I think sometimes we take for granted the knowledge that we have, and we assume our caregivers have even the basic knowledge of caring for somebody, even the repositioning, you know, caregivers may not know how to do that. So you really mm -hmm. have to go step by step. And it's very important to ask the caregivers, what are your fears? What are your expectations? What are your wishes for this right. journey? It's very important to ascertain that from your patients and your caregivers. Yes, <clears throat> I, I agree with all of this. I believe at, at times, our caregivers think they're very under-equipped, they're emotionally burned out, yes. but at the same time, when they help their loved one to complete this journey, there is, and, and, and maybe a, a hard word to use, but there's that satisfaction that I helped them all the way through. I gave, when I was getting married, you know, I vowed for better, for worse, richer and poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Right. And they were able to achieve that. It's a very special time to be with the patient, and yeah. it's a very rewarding to give the patient and fulfill the patient's last wishes. And a lot of our patients, one of their last wishes are to just die at home. And right. without those caregivers, that couldn't happen. Right. One of the things that we didn't cover is we have multiple people coming in at the end of life, and they're all in the same room talking at the same time. How is that perceived by the patient? Is a patient able to, to handle multiple conversations? No, I think that can be overwhelming for the patient. And the patient, like Mike um, discussed earlier, the patient knows what's going on. They mm -hmm. can hear everything that goes on. So it's, it's better for the patient to keep those conversations more to a minimal or to have all the multiple conversations in another room so that the patient doesn't get overwhelmed. Right. Another thing, too, from the spiritual side of this, I tell our caregivers, this is a time for you to be selfish. These will be your last moments that yes. you can spend, spend with your loved one. <clears throat> if there's immediate family members you want present, fine. But don't be afraid to be selfish and take that time to spend with your loved one. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because I stress that with my families as well. Just what you said. Be selfish. If you don't want people here, then put a note on the door. Right. Turn your phone off, do whatever you have to do to, right. to be selfish and spend that time with your loved one. And we at hospice can help 
there also the family members to address this issue how do how do we handle that so we can help them with those decisions Fantastic. and that's a nice segue into the next point i want to make is you i always leave my families w with asking them how do you get a hold of us and i always yes. stress 24 hours a day there's somebody available if you just have a question if you want to bounce something off one of us to call us at any time day or night they have to have that safety net it's that comfort um, so I always stress that especially as at end of life as that gets near correct that brings another good point how often have you seen a patient who has a half a glass of water sitting there and you ask them if there's anything you could do could you get me a fresh glass of water yes what is it about? Is that about the water or is it about the final cares, knowing that somebody cares? You know, it could be both. I think it's also that having that nice cold water, you okay. know, who likes to drink warm water? But that that's a great point that you bring up, that making sure that the patient just has those basic necessities as well. Right. Um, skin care is also very important um, as far as using a barrier cream on their bottoms, changing their diaper if that's what they have, um, because that is not comfortable for somebody to be laying in a wet diaper. Um, so it's very important that the caregivers know how to roll the patient to change the diaper or if they have a catheter, if they make sure that the caregivers know how to care for that Correct. catheter. But it's very important that patients are dry and their skin is nice and clean. How about aides coming in to help at that time? Our aides are the best, and our families can have an aide that comes in every single day to help with a lot of these cares. We can also have the nurse come every day. We can have one come in the morning, one come in the afternoon to do a lot of the cares for the caregiver. So they don't, it's really hard to, to change a diaper by yourself, especially if you don't have that training right. or if the patient's uncomfortable when we, when we do that. So making sure that the caregiver has the resources from us to, to appropriately manage the patient. That's a huge help for the caregivers. But hospice does not provide 24 hour, seven day of the week care. We correct? are intermittent care only. Our Thank caregivers you. are the 24 hour caregivers. We just augment that is all we do. Yeah, we're their support system for the caregiver. Correct. It's right. also very important that your families are familiar with um, the booklet called When Death is Near. Mm -hmm. I use that book to demonstrate a lot of the Correct. physiological functions that the body will go through mm -hmm. with the exception of the breathing. Um, make sure that they have read it or that they have at least a copy of it if they choose Correct. not to read it. Correct. If there's a lot of family members there, it, it's helpful to have a number of the booklets there. But it does an excellent job of explaining the different changes the body will go through. It will answer questions that you don't know that you even have. Am right. I not correct? Right. I also encourage my families to write down questions that they think of because yes. they are so overwhelmed <clears throat> and exhausted that, you know, when you go to the doctors, it's like, oh, I meant to ask you something and you can't remember it. So that's just another tool. They can correct. write it on the our 1877 number that they have posted on their fridge or wherever. They can write it down on the log where they mm -hmm. keep their medications that they've administered. But just encourage them to write down questions that they may have or to just call us when they think of them. Right. And I've noticed the nurses and I myself as a spiritual counselor in these homes always ask that one question before we leave. Is there anything else we can do for you? Do you feel that's important? Yes. It's very important. Again, you're ascertaining from the caregivers what else do you need from me Correct. so that you can care for your loved one without all that anxiety. Right. Right. It's very important. So hopefully we've addressed some of the pain issues, we've addressed the terminal restlessness, mm -hmm. and again, a lot of this is equipping not only the patient, but more so the caregiver or caregivers into the home. My final thought as well is that you are going to get asked at probably every single patient you take care of from the caregiver, how much time do they have left? Yes. And it's very important that you just give them an estimate because nobody ever knows so i always preface by saying nobody knows for sure mm -hmm. however i i will sum it up between okay they have hours to days or they have days to weeks or they have weeks to months or they you know maybe months okay. so try to be generic answer their question but not too finite where okay i'm going to hold you to that so okay but now i'm going to throw this out there but Lori, you were in here the other day and you were telling us that, you know, 
we have X number of days, but all of a sudden we see our loved one and they're doing so much better right. today. They're getting better. Right. Many patients rebound. They have that surge of energy right before their final yes. um, days of passing. So that is a great point that you bring up. Make sure that you explain that to your care caregivers that some patients do rally, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that they're going to get better. Right, right. So hopefully this has answered questions that you have, and I have nothing else at this time. I thank you for your time. Thank you.